For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. Lord, increase our faith. Even if we are acting like children who do not get their way. So this is my encouragement for you to seek and search the Action Bible. Hello, shalom, and God bless. Thank you guys for joining this sermon this week. Today is the day the Lord has made, so be sure to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's give thanks and praise to God with a shout of hallelujah. Praising God, creator most high, creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. Let's thank him today for the gift of salvation through the one and only name, Jesus Christ. Let's thank him for the life that Christ lived and the events of his life that were recorded in the Gospels for us so that we could take an example and live by that example. Let's thank him for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that when Jesus was hung up on the cross, was crucified, and when he was resurrected, he gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit to live by uh, the means that Jesus lived by. And let's be asked to be led by that spirit and his wisdom, understanding, and knowledge so that we can come to complete and mutual understanding of God's word and peace, unity, and edification by that word. All right, so we're going to continue through Jesus' healings this week. Uh, continuing in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to start with the story of a woman who has a bent back. Uh, she cannot stand up vertically. And there's a lot of things tied with this. We're going to cover over the use of the word upright in the Bible, both in the physical sense and also in the um, metaphorical sense. That's we are upright in character. Uh, we're also going to go over uh, the, the use of women in the Bible, and especially the Gospel of Luke, showing God's restoration of his people and also um, restoring his relationship with women and how, he's, how Jesus is healing women in the Bible. Uh, we're also going to go over healing on the Sabbath, which we've co sort of covered before, uh, but it's also included in this story and the importance of spreading God's word on God's holy appointed day and how that is used by Jesus and how it is used by the apostles uh, for healing and doing God's will. Uh, so let's dive into all of these topics today, and let's go to the Gospels themselves, starting with the Gospel of Luke. So we'll start our reading today with Luke 13, starting with verse 10, healing a daughter of Abraham. So as he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her. Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, There are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites! Doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't be, she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all of the glorious things he was doing. So just like any other book, as we're reading the Bible, we need to take note of who, what, when, where, and how. Uh, all of these things are relevant as you read through the Bible. So where? If this is happening inside a Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath day. Both of these are very important because we know this is a place filled with Jewish people. They know the scriptures. They also hold the Sabbath in high regard. We also notice a woman here, which is important. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, many women are healed, both men and women, but we see a lot of examples of women. And I think the idea here is that God is reconciling with women. Uh, this, this restoration that Jesus is doing is not just for men, but he's also reconciling women as well. Notice here, 18 years. So this woman had an, a disease that was not be able to be healed by the medicine at the time, by any sort of therapy. Uh, she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Also an important uh, piece of information to look at here. Uh, the woman, uh, or Jesus called out to the woman, you are free of your disability. 
Uh, this spirit, this unclean spirit, ha had disabled her, but the Holy Spirit is able to make her well. And also, that's an important idea as we read through this. Uh, so Jesus Christ, being the Word of God that became flesh, is able to heal this woman, and instantly she is able to stand upright again. So before we move on to the subject of healing on the Sabbath and what Jesus is doing here, let's focus on the woman being able to stand upright because we see that there's some metaphor taking place because when we're healed by Jesus, uh, he brings us into upright of character. Uh, upright here being used as a literary device, uh, very physically here for the woman, uh, but also, if we go through the Bible, somebody who is upright in conduct is somebody who acts righteously. And if you do a quick uh, search in your Bible app for the word upright, you're going to find a lot of context. I've pulled one of those out of many. So let's read Psalm 125 verses 4 and 5. Do what is good, Lord, to the good, to those whose hearts are upright. But as for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will banish them with the evildoers. Peace be with Israel. So even here we see literary devices in play. We see that somebody whose actions are wicked, they're compared to being crooked, not straight, not upright. And we see the woman in the story being very much crooked. Maybe she's not evil in conduct, but she needs to be healed by the Lord so that she can be made upright. She can walk straight, have a straight path. Again, this is all mentioned in the Bible, used a lot in the Psalms and the Proverbs uh, in, in a very poetic sort of way. And we also read about this in the Adam and Eve story at the beginning of Genesis. There is a lot of allegory going on here. Remember, remember the Bible uses lots of literary devices, and allegory is one of them. Uh, allegory is telling a story, but that story means uh, many different things or has a different meaning than what we read. And we see that here with the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. Let's read verses 13 and 14. So the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. So since the serpent was cursed to crawl on its belly the rest of its life, we know that maybe before the, the serpent had caused Adam and Eve to sin or tempted them to sin, it might have been upright before that. Uh, because why would it be cursed to crawl on its belly if it was already crawling on its belly? Uh, this tells us that whatever this serpent is, it was actually something upright in conduct before the fall, before Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and it itself was kicked out of the garden. And if we make the connection between this serpent and Satan, we know that at one point Satan was possibly an upright character, somebody of noble character, and he has fallen from that grace by this, by this disgraceful act. And that disgraceful act being deception, something that is not upright in conduct. Uh, so let's actually read previously in Genesis 1 verses 25 and 26. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So we read here that man was made in God's image, in his likeness, in accordance to how God acts. Uh, we know that God is upright and just in all he does. And mankind was created to be that way and to rule over all of God's creations. Uh, none of God's creations were created upright, but mankind was created to be upright. Uh, all the other creatures either fly or swim or crawl. Uh, they do not walk on two legs. Also note that the woman in Jesus' story could not walk upright. So we see the correlation and the metaphor being used there that when we walk upright, we, we walk according to God's commandments. We walk in his righteousness, in his goodness. God saw that everything he created was good. 
and we are to rule over that with an upright conduct, with upright character, uh, being upright and walking on two legs ourselves. And I actually did a little study on this, and, and humans are the only creatures that really walk upright with an upright vertebrae and on two legs. Uh, so let's actually dive into some of my Google studies here. All right, so this says many animals are capable of standing or walking on two legs for a short time. And some birds are also bipeds, meaning they walk on two legs. Besides humans, no other mammal, including all primates, regularly walks on two legs. All right, so we, what we read here is that the only creature here that walks primarily on two legs are human beings. Yes, some birds walk on two legs, though they primarily fly. And uh, human beings have an upright vertebrae. And the only animal that walks on two legs that also has an upright vertebrae. So this says nearly all primates are capable of bipedalism, although most spend the majority of their time on all fours. Humans do not. Primates move bipedally, but they also use bipedalism to stand up on their hind legs to reach food and look for predators. Some examples are baboons, bonobos, chimpanzees, and gibbons. So even though those animals can walk on two legs or are bipedal, human beings are the only ones that primarily walk on two legs in an upright position. And to back this up scientifically and medically, I've provided this Google search. How might the shape of the vertebrae be related to the upright posture of humans? The curvature of the lumbar spine in the sagittal plane, lumbar lordosis, is instrumental in maintaining upright posture because it stabilizes the upper body over the lower limbs in bipeds and allows the loads applied to the spinal column to be efficiently absorbed. So we know the woman in the story in the gospel has something wrong with her spine, right? She cannot stand upright and maybe she doesn't have an upright conduct and she needs the word of God. She needs Jesus to heal her of this. And we also know that uh, this, this is all in correlation to what is going on and, and what we're reading here with the spine and how human beings walk upright. And I just think it's awesome that the Word of God carries all of this intelligence within it, that it knows that the human being is the only one that walks upright, and that upright conduct is, is, is made in comparison to this, right? And human beings were created over the animals. We're supposed to have a different conduct. We were created in God's likeness. We're, we're supposed to be walking in uprightness, which in the Bible means to walk virtuously, to be righteous in conduct. So what happens when we are not upright in conduct? Let's read Psalm 69 verses 22 and 23. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. So we see when we are not upright, we are not upright in a physical sense either. At least that is the metaphor that we're reading here in this psalm, which is written in the style of poetry, meaning they use lots of simile and metaphor and comparisons. And maybe they're not even talking about our, fit, our backs being physically bent. Maybe they're making that same connection that I had made previously with those Google searches, knowing that when we're not upright in character, um, maybe our backs are bent in a metaphorical sense. And maybe we cannot see here, just as the people who are, are, are receiving sights, the blind are receiving their sight in the Gospels. Uh, maybe when we're blind, we're not physically blind, but we're blind to the spiritual. Maybe our backs can be bent in the spiritual as well. And maybe we also read about that with the woman in the Gospel whose back is bent and Jesus heals that. Maybe for us, our spiritual backs are bent and we need Jesus to correct us so that we can up walk upright once again. And to go deeper into this subject, let's go to 2 Peter 2 verses 10 through 12. Especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. Bold, arrogant people. They are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. So my main focus here is he calls people who act in a, in a not upright manner like irrational animals. Uh, they're creatures of instinct, creatures who seek to desire uh, and please their very own flesh. 
not what is spiritual. Uh, but we see the distinction here that we're not to be like the animals. We're supposed to be rational. Uh, we're to act upright because the animals were not created to be upright, neither in their physical posture, but also in their actions. Uh, so we must be better than the animals because remember back in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we were created to have dominion over all of God's creations, including the animals. We are to be more rational than they are. So let's turn our eyes now to Ecclesiastes 7 verses 25 through 29. I turn to my thoughts to know, explore, and examine wisdom and an explanation for things, and to know that wickedness is stupidity and folly is madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman who is a trap, her heart a net and her hands chain. The one who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Look, says the teacher, I have discovered this by adding one thing to another to find out the explanation, which my soul continually searches for and does not find. I found one person in a thousand, but none of those was a woman. Only see this, I have discovered that God made people upright, but they pursued many schemes. All right, so notice the use of the word upright there at the end. God made people to be upright, to be created in his image, uh, to walk on two, two feet, so to speak. Uh, but they pursued many schemes. And also notice here he found one person in a thousand who was upright, but not one of those was a woman. Well, remember in the Gospel of Luke, we've, we've read about the bleeding woman who was healed. We've, we've read about the, the daughter of Jairus. We, we read about the woman with the uh, scraps at the table and her daughter. Uh, now we're reading about this woman who has a bent back. She is not upright, but God is bringing healing and restoration to her. He's showing us in the Gospel of Luke many examples of how women are being reconciled to God. They're bring, being healed by God's very word, the, the word that became flesh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so Jesus did not come to exclude women, but also to include them in this sanctification. Uh, but, but because before this, uh, we see that there are not very w many upright women. Uh, there are some that we read about, uh, but the author here of Ecclesiastes has not found one. So I put the original gospel reading from Luke here back on the screen. Uh, remember I said it's important to note who, what, where, why, and how. Uh, the who here being the woman, the importance of her being a woman, uh, why her bent, her back is bent, uh, how she is being restored. Uh, but also note the where here, the, the synagogue and the time here, the Sabbath. Uh, so these are important here because the Jewish people... Uh, thought that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath by doing these things on the Sabbath, and that is truly not the case. And if we take the example of Jesus, we too must be preaching and healing on God's holy day, because this is the day that he has ordained not only for rest, but to do God's works. So notice here in verse 15, he calls them hypocrites because they untie their ox or donkey from the feeding trough uh, to lead it to water. Now, this was written in the law that this was part of the law of Moses that you were to do this and you could do this on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus is illustrating that we can perform the works of the law of Moses on the Sabbath day. It is not wrong to do so. They are doing so. Why? So why is it wrong that he is untying this woman from her bondage to sin and Satan on the Sabbath day? And this is why they're being hypocrites. And, and he put them to shame. He humiliated them uh, because they could not reconcile this. They could not answer his question because they indeed were acting like hypocrites. And we see this continues on in the book of Acts with the apostles. They begin to teach and preach the word of God on the Sabbath day, and we see this brings healing to the people. Uh, so this also gives us indication that we should be preaching, teaching, and doing these things as long as well as rest on the Sabbath day. And again, there are many examples of this in the Bible, most of which we've already read, Jesus healing people on the Sabbath. And if Jesus does it, we know it's okay for us to do it too, because Jesus was sinless, meaning he didn't break any of the commandments in anything he did. So if he didn't break the commandments by healing on the Sabbath, we, we know it's pretty safe for us to do so as well. There are many examples also in the book of Acts with the apostles. I've pulled up one just for reference, Acts 17 verses 1 through 4. A short ministry in Thessalonica. So after they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. 
As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a large number of the leading women. So again, we read about the emphasis of the leading women here and the importance of them believing and being persuaded into faith by Paul and Silas. But we also read that these, these are things are done on the Sabbath day. They are bringing healing to the people through the word of God, through the living word of God, Jesus Christ. So it is good for us to use God's Sabbath day, his holy day, not only for rest, but also bringing others to healing and rest themselves. Uh, Jesus did it, the apostles did it, and I think we can take good notes that is good for us uh, to do good things on the Sabbath and to do good for others. So let us use that day and every day uh, to preach God's word, bringing healing to all people and bringing that uprightness uh, to all people. And let's remember to use that upright conduct in our lives on a daily basis. Um, God created us to be upright. He created us uh, to have dominion over everything that he created. So it's also good for us to remember and to remind ourselves uh, that we were made better than the animals, uh, that we we are to act better than the animals and to act in an upright character because only human beings were created to be upright. All right, so let's remember all of these things, uh, the good news that Jesus brought and Uh, The importance is always Jesus and Jesus alone, uh, bringing people to him so that they too can be upright as he was in conduct. Amen. Amen. Give me a fist bump.